Anniversaries. Anybody celebrating anniversaries? Lead our prayers, please, sir. 
Just a little while. I believe this one was wrote by a man named E.M. Barclay. And I think he also wrote Victory in Jesus. And if I'm not mistaken, he's buried in Solomon. Yeah, kind of interesting history. Here we go, old song. Find us blood, jump in. It's kind of fast. You'll have to take a deep breath. Soon this life will all be over and our pilgrimage will end. We will take our heavenly journey, be at home again with friends. Heaven's gates are standing open, waiting for our entrance there.
I'm telling you. <laughs> Number 83 in your hymn book, if you want to take the hymn book out to look at. Go to Joel, pick this out about three, three verses there. We'll sing three of them. I love to tell the story.
said you'd go through it with us. Father, thank you for the promise of someday being somewhere better. Father, being somewhere where there's no hurting or heartache or sickness or pain, Lord, where we can just be with you and enjoy your presence. Father, I pray that if somebody here today doesn't know you in that way, that before this service is over, they will. Father, just pray that you would remove anything that would stand in the way of you being here. Lord, I hope that if someone has sin in their heart or our Father is distracted, that they'll speak to you in the next few minutes about it, Father, and that uh, they'll get that right with you so that you can do what you want to here today. Bless Brother Paul as he preaches. I pray that you'd give him a good voice to proclaim your message with, Lord, and help us to be good hearers. Bless the kids as they go to their class. Father, I pray that you would just have your will and your way in everything that we do here today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, this morning, if you have a youngster, first grade and under, who wants to go to children's worship, Miss Megan's headed that way.
like one old time preacher said, if that don't light your fire, your woods will. Amen. Good. I'm going to read this morning from Revelation chapter number three. And so I invite you to turn there in your Bible. This section that we're going to read is one of the letters to the seven churches that Jesus dictated a letter to each of them to John while he was on the island of Patmos. In the last verses of chapter 1 in Revelation, Jesus told John when he had this vision, he said, I want you to write the things which were, the things you've seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Well, this last church that Jesus wrote to was a church at Laodicea. And there are several unique things about this church that we're going to notice as we go through our message today. And I'm going to have to cover a lot of ground, so I'm going to try to talk quick. So I want you to listen quick and let's get through this, all right? Here's something I want to point out to you that's not in my notes. It's not on the slide, Brother Joel. But I want to remind you, and I feel that most of you are probably already aware of this truth, all right? These seven churches were literal local New Testament churches scattered throughout Asia Minor. Yeah. All right? They were real churches. And Jesus had a message to each of these seven churches. And he gave it to John. John wrote it down. They got delivered to these churches. Now, these seven churches also represent churches of all ages since Jesus began the church through the end of what we call the church age. But not only do we see these churches represented throughout all time, but also these seven churches, I believe, and, and, and a lot of people much smarter than me believe this too, but, but I believe they represent a historical picture of the history of the church from her beginning and Jesus is the one who established the church. Amen. All the way till the end. They are definite periods of history. And if you've ever studied the history of the New Testament church, you will see the characteristics of that church during that age and, and, and how they prospered, how they fell. What characteristics that Jesus pointed out about those churches were evident then. So we come to the last of the seven churches. It is the church at Laodicea. And if that is true, and I believe it is, then Laodicea is the last age of the church. Did you hear that? Now listen, if that's true, listen. If that's true, and once again, I believe it is, we are living in that Laodicean age. So that's a glorious and, and grand truth to know and to believe, watch this, that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ come back to meet his saints in the air, his children, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen, Amen and hallelujah. Amen. If that's true, and it is, then this church represents this age. Now watch this. If that's true, and it is, I'll get to my sermon. If that's true, and it is, all right? The church is not these walls, these pews, these lights. We are this New Testament church. Amen. Again, amen? amen. <coughs> if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for us, there wouldn't be a church here that's right. 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 on the garden side. This church wouldn't be here. So, when Jesus was speaking to the church at Laodicea. He was speaking to the church in the last days, and he was speaking to us. To us. He was speaking to us. Are you with me? Now, 
Here's my real introduction, all right? I, I, I gotta say something else, all right? I may never get to my sermon. I may have to buy this thing up. Brother Jay's gonna talk next week because next week's Gideon Sunday, but I hear so many people today who are talking about because they're concerned about is this the end of days? And I'm gonna tell you something, folks. Listen, look at it. Look at it. He's he's happy now, you got him up, Miss <laughs> That's the way they do. There's a lot of grown folks who like to get out of here right now, too. <laughs> because people believe we're living in the last days, people are concerned about things like the mark of the beast. You hear that talked about a lot now? I hear that. I get asked questions about that all the time, all right? And I'll tell you something. I'm not concerned. I mentioned this in my Sunday school class this morning, or our Sunday school class. I'm not concerned about the mark of the beast. And the reason why I'm not concerned about the mark of the beast is because I ain't going to be. Amen. Amen. Right? And if you're worried about the mark of the beast, you need to make sure you're not going to be. Amen. Right? What I'm more concerned about in my life and for us as a New Testament church if we're the church at Laodicea, is this what Jesus sees in us? The title of the message is How to Make Jesus Sick. Now, I want to talk about two things. Next slide, Brother Joel. You still up there, brother? I had to go to the nursery. He had to go to the nursery for a minute. I don't know what he went to the nursery for. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to get through this today, I promise. I want to talk about the blessing of persecution. If you ask what the greatest challenge facing the church, and I put that in quotation marks, if you ask what the greatest challenge facing the church today is, most people would say, oh, it's persecution. We're being persecuted, and I believe that we are. With the woke ideology and the cancel culture and everything that's going on in our, in, in our world today, especially in the United States of America, on a political, social, sinful scene, all right? Pardon me for saying it, but you just got to call it what it is, amen? Yeah. But I'm telling you, folks, we are under persecution. Those of us who believe in, name the name, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it will get worse. But the greatest challenge we face as a church is not persecution. What challenges us more than anything is this curse of lukewarmness that we're going to talk about in our sermon today. Well, we're going to see how it all comes about. You with me? It's going to be a fast ride. You ready? Are you ready? Some of you are, some of you are not so sure. <laughs> Revelation 3.14. <clears throat> and unto the angel, by the way, the angel means the messenger, of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the, Jesus is describing himself, These things saith the, Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Listen to what he says. I know your works. You are not cold nor hot. I would you were cold or hot. So then because you're not cold or hot, you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. I will spew you out of my mouth. Now, watch this. Here is the evidence of lukewarmness. Because you say, I am rich, I am increased with goods, I have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So I instruct you, I counsel you to buy me gold that has been tried in the fire, pure gold, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. 
and anoint thine eyes with I said that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him. I will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also ever overcame, and then will sit down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Got about four or five topics I want to cover that apply as we break down these verses today. I want to talk first about, about how Jesus identifies himself. He said, this is the one talking to you. I am the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And what Jesus is saying to the Laodiceans and to all who've read this and to all whom it will apply to, including us. He said, I, watch this, I, it, it's about the fact that he is eternal. He always has been. When you pick up Genesis 1-1 and you read the Bible, there is no explanation, no amplification in the beginning God. You either believe it or you don't. People say, I can't believe in God. Yes, you can. You choose not to. All right? So he says, I am the amen. That means so be it. That means that it is true. What did he say about himself? I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I am the faithful and true witness. Which says, look, he said, what I've seen, I'm telling you, and I know it's all true. And he goes back to the beginning of the creation of God. Amen. This is Jesus speaking. And there are so many cultish denominations and groups in our world today who do not acknowledge Jesus as God. Right. They will say he is a God. They will say he is the son of God. But Jesus said, I am God. He was there in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And he goes on and says, when he created, he said, let us. Why did he say, let us make man in our image? Because all three persons of the Godhead were present and involved in creation. Why did he identify himself as such? He said, look here. I have the right to look you over and to analyze you and to see where you are and to give you instruction. So there's the identification. All right. Next thing. That's pretty good. I got through that one quick, didn't I? Well, you're not going to like this one. <coughs> this is the condemnation. I just want to say very quickly, if you go back and read the letters to the other churches, every church Jesus identified himself with some distinct characteristic that might apply to them. And then he gave them a word of commendation. I want to brag on you because this is what you're doing good. I, I, Jesus lifted them up and said, hey, y'all keep doing this. This is the right thing to do. But listen, this church is the only church that there was no word of commendation to. All right? So as Jesus offers them, he says, I know your deeds. I know what you're doing. I am the faithful and true witness, the amen. I have the last word. I am God. I've been here since creation. I've watched it all. I've seen it all. So he jumps right into the word of commendation to these Laodiceans. He said, I know you. You're not hot. You're not cold. He said, you're lukewarm. I wish you were hot or I wish you were cold. But because you are neither, he said, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now, I bet I've preached this text in revivals 30 or 40 times in the last almost 50 years of preaching. And when I preached it, I always used the old ideal, the old application that, that Jesus would say, hey, Hot would be on fire for God. 
Cold would be cold. Nothing whatsoever. And I always said that. And, and I, would, I, would, I would make a graph. I would say, okay, here's hot, here's cold. Put yourself somewhere in between in your spiritual walk with God, all right? And you know, some people might say, well, I'm right here in the middle. Some people say, well, I'm a little bit more on fire with God than I was at one time. Some might say I'm right here. And they said, but I would always say it wouldn't make any difference because anything between here and here is lukewarm. All right? and, and that's a good application and it's a good illustration. But I have rethought my thoughts. And let me explain to you what I, what I want to say about that. I think that Jesus is saying that both cold and hot are good things. They're positive things. Hey, if, if I'm out working in the heat that we had up until, thank God for what little bit of rain, some got and a lot of us got more, all right? But thank God for the rain. But if you're out working in the fields or whatever you do and it's hot, and you sweat it, and you're tired, you're dehydrated, and you're in there, and you say, I want to drink the water. You don't want somebody to bring you warm water. You don't want somebody to bring you hot water. I want it cold. I want it cold enough to pour on my head and almost make me pass out, all right? I want a good, cold drink of water. I don't like bathing in cold water. Don't like jumping into cold water. If any of y'all ever went to to Sagmont, it's right this side of Joplin, Camp Sagmont. That was the coldest water in a swimming pool I've ever been in in my life. And we just go down there and wallow around in it the first week of July because it was hot. But there are times when I want hot water. I want warm water. All right? They're both positive terms. They're both good things. They both have healing qualities. They're both good for us at times, all right? But there, there is nothing good about lukewarm. I think what we would say that lukewarmness right there in the middle, if you would say that, that if cold is positive and it's good and hot is positive, it's good, but lukewarm is not, not worth anything. Jesus is saying he would rather you be cold He'd rather you be satisfying and soothing and helping the sun. He'd rather you be hot. However you want to interpret this passage, anything in the middle, lukewarmness isn't good. Right. <coughs> and Jesus said, because that's the way you are as a church, because that's the way you are as an age, if that's the way you are as an individual, you make me sick. You make me sick. What what brought about this lukewarmness in their lives? Well, I can tell you, he told them. He said they had the audacity, audacity to say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. I think the Laodiceans were, were self-deceived. Because they looked around at themselves at what they had. Look at me now. What they had accomplished. All that they had done. The work of their hands. The work of their labor. And they said, we don't need anything from anyone. We can take care of ourselves. I'm rich. I've become wealthy. I have need of nothing. And they thought that their security, their stability, <coughs> rested in what they had. I can't help but think, stop right now about flooding. Most of y'all heard um, yesterday an earthquake, 7.2 magnitude hit Haiti. Thank God. Thank God and praise God. Where Brother Norcellus lives and where his, his school and his focus of his primary ministry is they weren't affected. They were shaken, but they weren't affected. I praise you God Amen. for that. Well, I'll tell you, you will never go to Haiti and find any true preacher or any true Christian who will say, I'm rich. I'm wealthy. I'm increased with goods and I have need of nothing. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, 
you can find it very prevalent in the United States of America. Right. Let me go further. You can find it very prevalent in the state of Arkansas. Let me go further. You can find it very prevalent in northwest Arkansas, and you can find it very prevalent in our church. Right. That changed everything, didn't it? We may not say it. We may not think it. But it becomes evident in our lives and how we react to God and how we react to His church and how we react to ministry. We say, look around and look what we've done. We didn't do anything. God did it. Amen. And if we feel that way and we sit back on our behinds, pardon me, it got louder, and cross our legs and say, looky here, we don't need anything. God will remind us that without Him, we don't have anything and we're Amen. The result, he said, I'll tell you out of Well, let me tell you about Jesus' evaluation. Go to the next slide, Brother Joel. I love this. I don't like it, but I love his straightforwardness, all right? That's what they said of themselves, but Jesus said, look. Here's what I see in you. Now remember, they said, we're rich, we've become wealthy, we have need of nothing. Jesus said, you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Just quickly, wretched means distressed. And they become so comfortable in their own flesh where they were, they weren't even aware of. And they become miserable. It means, in the original, it means pitiful. You remember when old people, that's just pitiful. Watch well, what God said about them, all right? Uh, wretched, miserable, poor. They thought they were rich because it was material to them. But God's looking at them from a spiritual standpoint. And because they lived that way for so long, they become blind to reality. And what they don't know is, is they're really naked. That means brought out in the open. That means made ashamed. <coughs> if there's anything that stands out in these two, it was what Jesus, what they thought of themselves and what Jesus said about them. <coughs> Our estimation of ourselves is usually very different than what God knows about us. Amen. So God gives them a word of correction in verse 18. By the way, I will say this just as a word of grace. Aren't you glad we serve a God who's never surprised or amazed at us in any way whatsoever? Amen. I mean, today I got saved. God didn't say, well, I didn't think young would have made it. He knew me before I was ever born. Amen. When he did, and he did from my mother's womb, all right? And whatever I've done in my life, God didn't say, I would have never thought he'd have done that. He knew what I was going to do. And thank God, whatever I have done since I say still covered under the blood, all right? But here's what he tells them to do. And, and it relates back to what they thought they were and what they thought they had. He counsels them to buy gold refined by fire. They said, we're rich, we're wealthy, we're increased with good. But refined gold is a biblical illustration for purifying one's life. It's not material, it's spiritual they're lacking and they don't know that. They're told to buy white garments. Outer garments, one like Christ and the early people. So that they may clothe themselves and no shame, miss, no dishonor. And then he says, you need some ISAB. Why? Because they were blind. <coughs> because they couldn't see the way they were. And then this word of caution in verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. You better, you better get with the program. You better be zealous and repent. <coughs> I read, I read somewhere this week, and I'll, I'll read it to you, and then I'm going to be through in a moment. Why aren't we more effective in the world today? Is the problem simply the world? Yeah, the world's got worse. It's a bad place. Is the world too stubborn and too blind to listen? Yeah, the Bible says in the last days, they'd have cold hearts. They'd turn to themselves uh, away, and they would listen to teachers. Who would tickle their ears. But could it be that the problem is partly us? 
So many times we just are willing to sit back with the norm in our comfort zone to keep doing what we're doing the way we're doing it and not ever come to realize that maybe we've hit that lukewarmness where we're not effective and we're not positive to anything or anyone on either part of the spectrum. And Jesus said, listen, if you find yourself that way, you need to understand. He said, I love you. That's why I rebuke and chasten you. That goes back to Hebrews. We preached about that recently, all right? He said, so you need to be zealous. You need to be intentional. You need to be forthright about this. And you need to repent. He showed him that his love, his reproof of them, and he also showed them his grace. How does his grace enter in? Without his grace, we couldn't repent. I want to tell you, I'm glad that this chapter didn't end with verse 19. Verse 20. By the way, this is the invitation, but it shows Jesus' position with this church. It shows, this is not about salvation. We apply it to salvation. I want to say it again. This shows where Jesus is in reference to this church. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Where is it? Listen, this church has become so self-sufficient. He's on the outside. They've shut him out. It's not that he left intentionally. They shut him out of their lives, out of their church. And he says, I'm standing at the door. And I want to be a part. I want to be the focus. I want to be your center of attention in your lives, in your worship, in your church. But he said, if any man, just one person, he's talking to individuals. Remember I said, we're the church as individuals. But if one person, if one person will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and I'll have fellowship with him once again. Then he says, if you have ears, you need to hear. Why does he say that so often in the Bible? Well, first of all, because we do have ears. <laughs> but he says it predominantly because so often we choose not to listen. I don't want to make Jesus he said, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out. Maybe today we just need to do some old-fashioned soul searching and see where we are in our walk with them. And listen, it's real simple. If we find ourselves lukewarm, he said, what you need to do is repent. Repent means to say, I'm sorry, but it means to turn around. Whatever action it is that makes you that way. This is an invitation to Christian people today. If you're not saved, I want you to be saved. And the way you're saved is by receiving the one who wrote this letter. But God's people, see where you are. Make you Heavenly Father. As we have our time of invitation, I pray we'll be honest with ourselves. And honest with you, God. <clears throat> and Lord, if we need to respond as the Holy Spirit convicts us, I pray that we'll be honest enough with you and with ourselves. And we'll come and pray. Lord, we'll repent. We'll make things right with you. Lord, we don't want to make you sick. We don't want to trust in ourselves and anything we've done. We want it to be about you. If we've shut you out, may we invite you back into our lives and our church in Jesus' name. And while we stand together, what do we say? Just as I am.
like that. I want you to come down front this morning, and I want you to share that with us. You need to be willing to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And we're going to sing one last verse, and this is your chance to come. Please let it be today. Joe White family, the Maxine Tone family, the Roger Branch family, the Jenny the Dobbs family, the Leonard Surratt family, the Kaylin Reeves family. Lynette Benson, she and David recently started coming to our church in the last few months. She tested positive. She's at home. She's doing well. And uh, she wasn't here last Sunday. That's why I'm because she was sick. So that's a good thing. All right. Uh, Sherry and Pat Elkins are highlighted. Keep praying for Brother Darrell Chadwell. Especially pray for uh, Alan Jean Beatty and Janine Woodward and, and that whole Beatty family. All right. Johnny Rush had to go back for emergency surgery. He's doing well. It, it was it was prayer that, that caused it the second surgery to go as well as it did. Keep praying for Miss Marilyn. She's kind of seeking treatment and which way to go. Uh, who else do we need to mention today? Yes, Eric. What, what was her name? She's not here, isn't she? Okay, yeah. All right, Kathy Rose. Thank you. Anyone else have a prayer with them? Yes. My cousin's name, Mormon, is on there, but he, uh, I talked to him Friday, and his numbers have went up from like 19 to 28, 29. But he does go back to the and to the state for all of his body issues and everything he goes to and then they travel with his family and they just keep trying to go to the numbers. All right, thank you. Same Lord, Randy. Keep praying for Donna. She's having treatments. The doctor was felt like they got it all, but keep praying for her. She's going through treatments, and that's precautionary. All right, lift her up. Who else had a prayer request? Yes, back there. Um, my cousin Lisa Allen. She's having open heart surgery on Thursday. Lisa Allen. All right. Thank you, Karen. Who else? Yes, Garland. All right. Mike Anderson. Thank you, the family of Mike Anderson. <clears throat> and who else? Anyone else have a prayer request? Yes. Um, like we had asked a couple weeks ago for Grace and Holly, she lost a battle to Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't remember the last name, but it was it was a prayer request made a couple weeks ago. Well, my clear. Let's bow our heads, pray for these, bless this offering, and we'll be gone in just a second. They always usually are there for us, please, sir.